Hello, everyone. Welcome to this month's Information Systems Security Association Los Angeles chapter virtual meeting. We've been having these virtual sessions since March. Uh, no telling how long they'll last, but we do appreciate you joining us. We've got a very special uh, event scheduled for today. We're looking forward to hearing what our experts have to share with us. Um, a little bit about ISSA Los Angeles. We are indeed the founding chapter of ISSA International, uh, founded over 30 years ago by two women. And the field in information security for women still needs a lot of help to get these people into the field. Um, so keep that in mind as you hire and as you look for good people. And we'll hear more about hiring in a little bit from our great panel today. Um, the goal of ISSA LA to promote management practices that ensure CIA and not the ones that uh, the government works on. Um, I want to give a big shout out to a wonderful crew that uh, is responsible to help bring these to you as well as our famous security summit and our trainings that you'll hear more about. This is our board of directors. Um, just really a good group of people, all volunteers, all spending hundreds of hours a year to help give back to the community. Um, if you're not volunteering for something, anything, whether it's InfoSec or not, I strongly advise you to take a look. It's very rewarding. Uh, it gives you a, a little bit more purpose in life. So uh, do consider it. We all would appreciate that. Um, our community, we try to be active. We try to have relevancy. And we also certainly want your input. So please do visit our, our website. Very simple, issala.org. Um, you can get notifications. We don't have a whole lot of emails. You won't get spammed, but you'll get relevant information uh, that, that can help you. Uh, but bottom line is it'll help you stay connected with your fellow InfoSec professionals. I want to give a shout out to our educational sponsors. These folks have uh, agreed to provide free or discounted services and training and education to our members. So please um, consider visiting them and getting some good information and some cases free resources for you to help you with your career because we all need to continue to learn that's important and that's not just in our field but in everything in life so please do um, and of course this social media um, we're on most of the well-known platforms right now uh, slightly different handle on a few of them so do take a look at this slide anything of interest to you jot it down and come join us uh, we have some good discussions uh, we repost really fascinating articles that uh, be worth your time to read. Um, and, uh, you know, we would love to see you post and help us in, uh, in Insta Instagram uh, because we're, uh, we're too old, so we need your help. Um, how about upcoming meetings? Okay, uh, how many of you are familiar with the CPRA, that California Privacy Rights Act passed? You, the voters of California, put it out there and it passed. So that means a lot more stress on your organization is got regarding privacy. And the question is, do you know what you're going to have to be doing? There is a little time to prepare and get ready for it. But our expert panelists will help you. We have uh, lawyers and people who specialize in privacy. I uh, strongly advise you to consider that. December 30th. We're going to finally get close to getting rid of this damn 2020 year. Uh, I don't think anyone has been particularly happy with what's been happening, uh, but let's help it go out in a good way. Uh, this is a purely social get together. Um, we'll be holding it on Discord. Some of you may or not, may not be familiar with that platform, um, but if you want to um, go up and, and take a look at our site, I'm not sure if it's posted yet. Uh, but there will be an opportunity. It's just going to be an informal gathering using Discord. We'll have separate rooms you can go into based on theme, like music or, you know, I don't know, food, whatever. We'll come up with, with a few and, and you can just go in and join people and you can pop in from room to room and, and just share because, uh, you know, we're not having that networking. You know, we, we, there were all these virtual events on these great platforms like Zoom, right, Andy? And there's also wonderful, you know, conferences, but there's no, um, you know, talking in the aisle or in, in the in the alleyway or in, in the lobby of the hotel. There's none of that informal discussions that help lead to great solutions where you work. We're missing that, right? We're also just missing that good social interaction. Um, so, you know, 
maybe having something like this will help. So this is going to be a, a, a get together for both ISSALA and the OWASP Los Angeles community. I'm in, I, I lead both groups, so I figured let's bring them all together. So hopefully you can join us. Um, but to the business at hand, today's great panel. I wanna thank Chris for helping organize this. And I really love the people you brought together. It's gonna to be a good discussion. Uh, please do ask questions of our panelists. Um, if, if you log into, well, you don't need to log into, just go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and just type in I-S-S-A-L-A into the, into the location that asks you, and you can start typing away. You can do it with your name, or you can do it anonymously. So we want you to feel comfortable, whatever you're, you prefer to do. So um, I want to introduce Chris. Uh, CEO at Tyro Security. Uh, I've known Chris for many, many years. He's been a great uh, supporter of ISSA Los Angeles and OWASP. He's always been at our summits. Uh, he even let us use his space for a couple of meetings. Thank you, my friend. And, uh, you know, he's good for the community. You know, he has his own business to help with people, um, but he, he represents more than just a business owner. He's actually an active participant and volunteer in, in the uh, community. Are you still heading up uh, Cloud Security Alliance, Chris? Yeah, I am. Yeah, still president, second year in a row. I think this will be my last, but uh -huh. I'm sure yeah. I'll still be involved. All right. And um, Chrissy, um, I've known for many years. She's actually volunteered and helped with OWASP and ISA. She's a senior consultant at Tyro. And Marissa um, actually was a former board member at ISSA Los Angeles. Thank you for your service, Marissa. Appreciate that. And she's a recruiter at Tanium. And then Andy Grant, he's the head of offensive security at Zoom. I, I've heard of that company somewhere. Um, so thank you for joining us. I'm going to uh, disappear because it's more important that you hear from the rest of these folks and uh, enjoy this. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Chris. Thank you so much, Richard. I appreciate the, the welcome. Um, and thank you everybody for joining. So uh, we've, we've got a few questions here and make sure, so the questions, uh, I think if you go to sli.do, remember there's a little hashtag sign there, ISSALA, type your questions in, you can do it anonymously or not, it's completely up to you. And I'm gonna be checking them as they come in and, and asking the panel. So um, again, thank you for, for the guys on the panel as well. Thank you very much. I've known Marissa and Chrissy for a while. And then this has introduced me to Andy. He's a great guy. We love Zoom. Yeah. Um, so thank you all. Uh, why don't we start? I mean, the, the actual title for this panel is really imaginative. We went with cybersecurity hiring in a pandemic. Um, I guess it does what it says on the tin, right? So um, let's start off and and I think probably a good thing is, is maybe just to start off with a little bit of an introduction. Richard did a bit of one there, but if you could each let us know a little bit about you. So I'll start off, I'm looking at my screen here. So let's start off with Marissa, because you're there in the corner. Sure. Well, my name is Marissa. I've been a recruiter for over 10 years now, not to date myself, but I started off in, in government contracting on the East Coast and eventually got tasked with some cyber roles and fell in love with the industry. So when I moved back to LA, I started working for uh, a staffing agency for a short stint of time. And then I went internal again and started uh, recruiting for security consulting firms. And then eventually I transitioned to NCC Group where I worked together with Andy, uh, so I've done everything from recruiting to managing a team, and now I work for Itanium as an internal recruiter. Thank you. Chrissy, over to you. Hi, everyone, and thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Chrissy Morgan. I work with Chris at Tyro Security. I've been with the company for two years um, in recruitment for three. And prior to that, I worked in mental health. So I have kind of a different background from most recruiters you might meet. Um, and Chris is gracious enough to give me the opportunity to kind of focus on helping develop candidates too. So it's a personal interest of mine to, to help you guys succeed. So I'm really glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Chrissy. And then over to you, Andy. Hi, uh, yeah. Um, as I was introduced, I'm Andy. I'm the head of offensive security here at Zoom. Um, I am uh, responsible for building out our proactive security uh, uh, operations. 
Um, prior to Zoom, I was with NCC Group for 12 years, where I worked through all the security consultancy ranks, ending up as their technical vice president and ran the San Francisco office uh, for NCC for five of those 12 years, where I was the hiring manager out of there. Got started into security space, offensive security when I was pretty young, went to DEF CON 9 all the way back at Alexa Park. Um, and really excited to be here and talk about what, what it's been like. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I probably know most of the people on here, but uh, I've been involved in tech recruitment for 20 years now. And for eight and a half years, I've been solely focused on cybersecurity recruitment. I've got a company called Tyro Security, cybersecurity recruitment and professional services firm based out of Los Angeles, but covering the US. Very heavily involved in the community and I pop up at quite a lot of conferences. If I'm not if I'm not speaking, I'm usually attending. So um, if you ever see me around, come say hi, please. So right, let's get going. Um, I want to. We've already got some questions coming, which is fabulous. Um, let me start first of all, though. Uh, and and the reason why we, we've got you guys on the panel is because we've got different perspectives here. We've got an internal recruiter, we've got an external recruiter, and we've got a hiring manager. So we're getting a few different uh, perspectives here. So let's start off. Um, with what we've really seen from the, the initial sort of pandemic hitting and the big push for everybody to work from home, California shutting down until now, how have you seen uh, hiring, hiring change uh, for you personally in your position? And again, we'll start off with, with Marissa. We've, we've actually seen hiring increase. Uh, again, I work directly for Tanium, so we're seeing our customers use Tanium in a very different way. Um, and a lot of customers, since they're working from home, are looking to manage their endpoints a bit differently. So they're you know, essentially buying more Tanium. So we've certainly ramped up in terms of our hiring. Uh, and not that things are ever slow, but we've certainly seen an increase um, since the pandemic. Great. And then uh, Chrissy, as an uh, external recruiter, what, what have you seen? Yeah, I would I would agree with Marissa. We've we've had a, an extraordinarily busy year. Um, last year was also quite busy. There was a brief moment there where a few of our clients pressed pause on hiring, but um, overall, I would say we're seeing a lot more um, specialist engineering positions this year than um, last year. I think we had a few more kind of senior management positions last year. That's I would say the major difference. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Chrissy and Andy. Yeah, um, obviously, Zoom's uh, been growing aggressively since the pandemic hit. Um, and so within Zoom and my position, there's lots of hiring going on across the industry. I've really seen a greater emphasis on looking at candidates who have working remotely experience already uh, for those companies trying to build out and don't have established histories of working from home. So you have sort of people ready to be part of a remote team um, from the get-go, as opposed to this being their, their first um, experience with that. Although that obviously hasn't been disqualifying candidates uh, from my, my experience, uh, it just is something that uh, might give you a leg up. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny, um, we kind of, we, I guess we are slightly skewed in this panel because we've got companies that would all grow in the pandemic, right? Companies that would be, be affected in a positive way. I'm sure if we had somebody here from an airline or, um, you know, you know it's one of the, the industries that have been affected a, a lot harder, they'd probably be telling you something different. But I know the, the ISC squared bought out their workforce study just at the end of last week and they showed a slight decrease in the skills gap, but they put it down to some of those companies that were affected that completely had to close. So those jobs completely went away. Um, but they, they said other than that, that was, I think it was like 7% of people had been affected. The ones that I know had new jobs within a week, um, you know, especially those ones that are in very high demand areas like cloud security and things like that. So I do think they're, they, you know, we're not saying that people haven't been affected, but in terms of what we've seen, there's definitely been good growth and good opportunities. And I know somebody had specifically asked about uh, the increase and de decrease in security roles. Um, now, uh, I know somebody else has asked here about how companies, have many companies asked us or have your companies been focused on 
um, the presence of minorities or women in security. And that's a really hot topic at the moment. Um, so maybe, let, maybe we'll go the opposite way around and we'll start with you, Andy, um, and, and see how you're focused on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, hiring uh, diverse candidates is definitely a, um, something that Zoom is proactive about. But uh, uh, for, for this topic, I'm speaking for myself um, and not uh, as representative of Zoom or their, their policies. And I, I think uh, increasing diversity is very important, um, whether it's minorities or, or women or any un unrepresentative category. And I find that because they have different perspectives. Any background brings a different perspective into the space and that really helps. I uh, did a presentation a while back on a tool that I had worked with um, a coworker of mine about uh, how to secure data when you cross a border and going through border protections and mobile data and social media data. And at the end of the presentation, after we talked about the tool and what we looked at, uh, somebody in the audience raised their hand and said like, you know, border crossing is great, but this sounds really fantastic for do uh, domestic abuse situations. And it was a completely different space than we had consider our, our tool or our research for. And it was because these people had different backgrounds that they were able to contribute to a, a very important um, perspective uh, for, our, for the research to then take a look at. Brilliant, that's a, that's a great example of that. Chrissy, what, what have you seen? Yeah, I would say um, we do have a lot of clients who are often asking for more diversity in their teams. Um, women and, uh, and other minorities are definitely still underrepresented. Um, we tend to put a special focus on those areas. We actually have a very diverse team ourselves at Tyro Security, which is amazing. And so I put a focus on recruiting women and I'm always happy to, to speak with women who are interested in getting into security as well. Um, but yeah, I would say the majority of our clients now definitely are seeking more diversity on their teams. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Marissa? So I'm, again, I'm speaking on behalf of myself as well, not particularly Tanium in general, but diversity is important to Tanium and it is something that we're actively incorporating into our recruiting strategy always. Um, but I mean, me, myself, personally, I always incorporate diversity sourcing when I'm searching for candidates and just kind of my overall experience in the industry, being a woman, being a person of color, it's always been important to me as well. So um, I'm on the leadership team for the SoCal chapter of Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu. We're always talking about different training and opportunities that we can create for the community. So, you know, even outside of my day job, I'm looking for how do we create the skills to fill these gaps that we're always hearing about? Because if the, if the communication is that the skills are not out there, how do we create them where there are none or a lack thereof? Yeah, absolutely. There's, um, there, we, we need to do more as a community on the whole, not only um, to, to develop people generally, right? But I think even just the diversity area, we need to do more for underrepresented groups. But I think generally needs, more needs to be done for people that are, are entering the, the workforce. Um, I know from a diversity point of view, Chrissy spoke a little bit, and, and we're very heavily involved in all of the different communities. and. That's one thing I recommend both to companies that are looking to bring more diversity into their pool of candidates, um, but also to individuals that um, are out there looking. And you know, if you're struggling to see more people like you in our industry, they do exist. It might be that you need to join some of these groups and, and find out you know, what programs and things that, that are going on. So there's a lot you can be involved in and I know um, and actually all, all four of us from our previous discussions have been heavily involved in areas of that from our own personal points of view at companies, current companies and previous companies. Um, so that's amazing. That, um, to, to carry on talking about what actually is happening out there and, and what changes we've seen, like with the recruitment process, I definitely, I mean, obviously there's, there's no real face-to-face -face or flying people in, but the, other than that, what are the other things that you've seen change, both positive and negative, 
from from the pandemic in the hiring process and these are good things that perhaps managers can learn how to deal with the ones that are looking to hire now and also candidates can sort of manage their expectations out to, as to what's going to happen so um how have you found things change let's start with you chrissy Yeah, I would say um, we have more and more opportunities to bring in remote candidates. I mean, that's pretty obvious, but I think before the pandemic, there was a lot of pushback about bringing candidates directly into the office and relocation. So it's opened up the market in a really interesting way. We're able to find top talent and then you know place them without the expectation of relocation. Um, but of course, not all clients are open to, to having people fully remote. They're either not set up for it or, so we do run into some challenges with having to figure out how to relocate people after the pandemic, not knowing when it'll end. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, and then also just, you know, being able to get people up to speed working from home too. I think a lot of people are, are some people are missing working in an office as well. So lots of challenges there. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting how people are, um, how companies are struggling to know, like we, none of us can kind of know what the future is going to look like right now. And it's so hard when you're hiring to also talk to people and like not be able to tell them where they might or may, may or may not be after this sort of work from home thing is kind of not required, you know, it's optional. Um, so yeah, it's interesting times. Andy, I don't know how you've, you've found things. Yeah, um, one of the interesting challenges I've had to adjust my typical process, uh, when I was with NCC, I did almost all of my uh, interviewing and hiring in person. I did an occasional remote interview um, for international candidates uh, that weren't, weren't able to fly in, but it was all in person. and. One, uh, they would be back-to-back -back interviews. So um, an interviewer would come out um, of talking with the candidate and the other group of assigned interviews, viewers would huddle real quickly and you'd get instant sort of just like, you know, casual feedback or like, I covered this, I didn't get to that. You know, the, I felt like they were strong here, let's push on it. I felt like this was a weak area, like see if they, how well they can like adapt and grow in that area. And I've had to adjust for that in the in the virtual um, interview process of how do I get that instantaneous feedback um, when everything's sort of in this written form, um, try to jump on a video chat in between without keeping the candidate sitting around um, too long. It's, it's odd. I have found uh, I feel much ruder being late to a virtual meeting um, uh, because somebody's just sitting there in front of the, their screen as opposed to somebody waiting in a conference room where they maybe see that I'm just standing outside talking or something. And so trying to incorporate that in and then sort of like what Chrissy uh, was talking about with the remote um, environment, how do you interview for can work well remotely? Like that's, that's a skill set I do care about now that I didn't care about uh, specifically and how do I sort of incorporate that into the interview questions and stuff is still something I'm, I'm working through. Yeah, that's great. I, you know, I was thinking uh, before we came on here and we were talking about set up, home setups, right? Very, very, very much in detail. But I'm guessing now it, that, you know, even that might be quite an important question that you now start speaking to candidates about, oh, like, how do you work from home? What's your setup at home? You know, and I've never really thought about that before. Um, yeah, uh, it's one of the things that uh, I've um, I've started to talk to candidates about. I, I suggested um, in the earlier question that you know skills of having worked remotely in the past, and so if they have that, then I talk through their process. But now that people are all working remotely, I talk to them about like what has been your approach, or how do you plan to approach this. Um, if you haven't been doing it sort of like if this is your long-term situation like are you thoughtful about how this is are you still at your dining room table trying to sort sort things out which you know we just have to work through a process and understand it but it, i like to see sort of some thought having gone into this situation that they find themselves in yeah, that's good you can learn a lot from um people's thought process and how they deal with challenges so actually this has probably brought a really good opportunity for you to go through people's like, you know, solutions, you know, solutions engineering, you know, how did they work this one out? What did you do when, when this first sort of came down? 
Yeah, in the cybersecurity space, it's also that like, you now work from your home network. What did you do to lock down your home network since you don't have your, your corporate IT protecting your systems as much? And so it's also sort of, did they put thought into, you know, their their home system if it wasn't already locked down being, you know, a paranoid member of the industry? <laughs> yeah, of course, Marissa. So we've seen kind of an elastic effect. Initially, we would fly people to, our headquarters in Emeryville for a final on-site interview where you'd meet with a few people. And of course, we're, we're not doing that anymore. So we had to schedule each of those interviews separately. So initially, right, it was an expansion of our existing process. And there were a couple more layers to the interviews. But now, you know, we're meeting, we're finding maybe we don't need quite as many interviews or as many interviewers. There's a way to condense the process and still get the same great hires, the same, uh, just a better experience. So we're in the process of potentially cutting back on some of those interviews now. Uh, and then hopefully when things do go back to whatever the new normal is going to be looking at how we incorporate that into this new consolidated process. That's really good to hear because it's a challenge and you guys chime in at any time while we're sort of talking over this, but uh, there is a challenge that we've seen. We've actually seen processes get longer, which is insane when you think that, I mean, I've been in the industry 20 years and actually interview processes are taking longer than they did before. You know, everything else we're working on high efficiency, we're much more, you know, much better at doing certain things. And yet the interview process is getting longer and it's insane. And, uh, you know, I guess there used to be, we used to get everybody together in a panel and that would be the final interview, but now it's finding six people to all find gaps in their times and somebody else doesn't have to take half a day off they have to take gaps in their time and all of a sudden you know these processes are taking um for some companies a long time and they're actually losing people because of that so it's um it's a strange scenario we're in i'm always there trying to encourage people to try and do what they can to fix their, their process and make it as compatible with the candidates that they want to attract as possible yeah and i think it's important to note that no matter what your process is, it's never something that's going to be set it and forget it. We always have to evolve our process to what is going on around us. What are our competitors doing? What can we do that sets us apart? Maybe it's not about what your competitors are doing, but what should be done as an industry setting a new standard, a new expectation, and then letting your competitors catch up to you. Yeah, absolutely. Got, got to keep, always keep um, improving. It was a continuous CICD, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so actually, I've had a couple of questions come out on, and I know that it was something that was in my mind, which I'm going to start off with, like, has there been much of a change in the type of um, skills or the type of people that you have been hiring for since the pandemic started? Um. Yeah, so I talked to, about the remote um, skill, but uh, and adding on to that, we we always talk in the cybersecurity space of like communication isn't always our strongest suit, and so that's an area where if you can stand out um, as written or verbal communication skills, that you can set yourself apart from other candidates. I find that even more so in the in this remote working situation is because you d you don't get a lot of of real direct synchronous communications. And so you have to really have your written communications down to succinctly write a question or convey um, you know, a summary of what you've been doing. I don't get to just stop by somebody's desk and be like, oh, what have you been doing the past few days? How's the project coming along? You know, I have to ping them in chat or write an email and get that communication back. And so evidence of that uh, communication skill set is definitely something I keep an eye out for. Yeah, that's a great point. We definitely, le we lose the, uh, we were, me and Chrissy had spoken about it before, like losing that learning by osmosis or, you know, just the conversations of hearing what somebody else is doing and then, oh, actually, no, I'm working on something that's relevant. Let me speak to them about it. You just miss that. So I don't know whether anybody's found any solutions to, to, to that. If they have, I feel like it's, um, it's a multi-million dollar uh, idea for somebody there. Yeah, there's, um, my, my wife uh, started a, um, a new job um, a few years ago and to get up to speed, she, she, um, when she was in the office, she would see a partner um, going into a conference room and she'd poke her head and be like, can I sit in here? Can I sit and listen to the call you're about to have, the meeting you're about to do and learn through that osmosis? 
And so trying to replicate that, I, I encourage the whole team to have open calendars so everybody can see the meetings that are on your calendar and then encourage new hires um, to sort of stock people's calendars and be like, hey, there's something you're, you're about to do or be involved in. Can I sit in on that or can you, you know, give me a, a rundown of it after afterwards? Yeah, that's great. Have you found anything, Marissa, that, that you guys are doing? It's a hard thing to replicate. We, we're finding it challenging. You're still on mute. <laughs> I do it every time, so don't worry. <laughs> so we haven't really changed what we're looking for in candidates. Um, the team that I recruit for at Tanium, we're uh, one of the younger groups within the company, but we're the fastest growing in the company's history. So there's a lot of really great opportunity. And initially it was just calibrating what it is we're looking for, but now that we know um, you know, the, the kind of candidates that will succeed and do well in the roles. Uh, it hasn't changed. A lot of the people that we were hiring were remote to begin with. Um, so the only places we've really kind of seen a bit of variation would be with some of our, our federal customers. So, right, if, you're, if you've got a clearance, usually you've got to be on site. So um, in that case, a lot of that hasn't changed, but um, the profile has pretty much stayed the same. Right, right. And then Chrissy, you mentioned at the beginning that you're seeing more engineering positions than sort of management and uh, higher level ones, like strategic ones. Um, is there anything more you can sort of tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the need for those specialized skills is only increasing. I mean, I think our audience understands it better than I do. Um, the need for security certainly isn't going away. And it's not that, that the need for leadership is, it's, I think it's an issue of like allocating their budgets to like where they need, they really need like those on the, on the ground, like hands on the keyboard, boots on the ground defenders. And um, yeah, the, the skills, I mean, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that there, it's necessarily a skills gap. It's just, it's still a very candidate driven market. It's still really hard to get to get enough um, security engineers. So I, I don't know if I answered your question, Chris. No, but. no, I think you did. Yeah. I, like the, the thing that, and, and I, there's been a couple of questions already come in about it. And I know yesterday at my ISC squared security Congress talk, I got a lot of questions around it. The experienced staff area, we've definitely seen an uptick but I know it's been really challenging for people that are entry level that are trying to get into this industry. And the crazy thing is when we talk entry level, we could be talking about people with 10 years of IT experience that are looking to transfer into security. Um, so I'm like, you know, I guess we should keep this quite wide open because I can think there's going to be a huge amount of questions around this, but I mean, what are you seeing and what advice would you give to entry level people? And what do you think we need to do as an industry? Um, Marissa, any thoughts, Andy? Chime in whenever you're ready. There's, so I think one thing to know is if you're looking to get your first position, it's no different from any other industry. It is very competitive. There are more and more people going to school for this, looking for opportunities to get into the industry, as well as some people who just find it interesting and don't have a traditional educational background. So know that you are up against people who've just been like tinkering with things for a long time versus education. And they're really, I would say for internships, for entry level positions, it's very specific to the company and what it is that they're looking for. But I know Tanium, we've expanded the number of interns that we are hiring for 2021. Uh, and the team that I recruit for, I stood up a skill bridge program. So it's a partnership with the DOT, with the DOD to hire military that are transitioning to civilian employment, um, specifically for certain kinds of roles, our engineering roles, our integrations engineer roles, and you know technical project managers, tech writers. So you know even though a technical background is needed for some of them, right? It's not necessarily always going to be a hands-on role. So keep an open mind and there's always going to be a lot of options, but there are always going to be a lot of people applying to those roles. So really think about how you're making yourself stand out on your resume. Um, what are you putting on that resume that's going to make us pull that resume versus 
yours or the 150 other applicants that we got that day? And then how do you stand out in the interview? Um, you know, bring something that sets your story apart and your passion apart um, and your aptitude apart from someone else. And like Andy said, bring a different perspective because that's where diversity really does matter. Uh, and also like long-term, are you looking for this to just fill up your summer or are you looking for this as a career long-term? Uh, and also from a diversity standpoint, even though you're entry level, that doesn't always necessarily mean that you are young or coming fresh out of school. You could be someone who's decided to re-career and go back to school. So our internships are expanded also to postgraduate uh, candidates as well. So regardless of your age, if you just got your master's degree and you're 12 months from your graduation date, you would still qualify for an internship with us. That right. is paid and does offer a home office stipend. Brilliant, nice. Andy? Yeah, um, growing, growing people's career is a big part of why I got into management. You know, I still love the day-to-day hands-on keyboard technical hacking job, but like I really have a passion for helping other people build the career and do the job that, that I love. And so I'm, I'm very much into supporting entry-level candidates. Um, the way I've approached that here at Zoom is um, I have to staff up to meet the immediate needs of Zoom first, um, but through that process, I'm identifying p- candidates um, and, and it sort of gives them a leg up over others who are interested in being mentors or helping junior people grow. And so I, um, I look for those skill sets and then keep that on my roadmap as I go into the next headcount cycle of like baking in junior roles um, of people who need onboarding and stuff. And so very much in, into that, it will be different in this remote situation. There's not that, sh- you know, like you're saying, learning by osmosis and stuff. And so you can't just bring somebody in, but screen sharing um, and just like having an open audio or video channel throughout the day w- with a new candidate can uh, go a long way in helping them get up to speed. Brilliant. Yeah. And I know, and Chrissy, you've helped out in some of the sort of doing, and as a recruitment company for us, we work on the jobs that we have our clients give us and you know then they they very rarely come to us with entry level positions because that's one area where they get a lot of response and they can generally they, they're looking to invest into those people there's a lot of people looking for those so for us we don't get to place many of those but i know chris has done some work with various groups and we we definitely both give time up i'll talk a bit about something i'm working on at the moment but but chrissy I know you've done some work um, helping those those people looking to enter the industry. I have, yeah. I've I've really enjoyed having the opportunity to do um, like some career coaching roundtables at different um, conferences and security meetups, which has been really rewarding. And I've gotten a positive response from that. And if there's anyone out there who would like me to look at their resume, um, I should probably note that I'm quite busy, so I'll do my best to get back to you. I don't know how many people are on this today, but um, but yeah, it's it's been great. I mean, we, we got to help out with the Career Village at DEF CON this year, and we've done a lot of women in tech and, and different diversity events. Um, and one thing that I really see that can make kind of an early security career candidate stand out is, first of all, to have a really strong LinkedIn profile make sure that it matches your resume. And I mean, just Google how to make your LinkedIn profile look great. I mean, there are a ton of resources for that, but um, you really want to have a a nice, clear photo, um, a clean, clear mission statement, all of those things. And then, you know, having your resume looking really organized, I'm always shocked how many people don't do a spell check on their resumes. So that's a really important one that a lot of hiring managers really will move you to the bottom of the pile for those kinds of things. Um, And then also being an active member of the security community is huge. It shows that you that you really care that you're all continuing your growth and development. And um, and that you are open and willing to evangelize security in in the community or in your work community. So I think those are great ways to make yourself stand out too. Yeah, I would echo um, some of what Chris was saying about the the resume in particular, uh, that um, 
Having a, a well-structured uh, resume um, and job profile that you put out there, it does, is eye-catching. If if you, you know, if you can't keep your resume to, you know, like the one page, I'm, I'm not going to talk you if it's one page. I'm going to talk you if it's over three pages because that shows a lack of ability to distill information about yourself. Um, and how would I expect you to distill important information about the jobs I assigned to you? But then, um, but then also like, if you're trying to apply for an entry level position, don't oversell um, your your expertise in an in an area that you you're maybe trying to stretch. Like, be more transparent about like what your skills are and what you're comfortable with. But do talk up the the maybe not directly job relevant things that you are an expert in or have built a lot of experience in. Because showing you can achieve excellence or competency or an expert level of a skill in a different area shows me that you can reach that if you're given the right tools and opportunities. And so it doesn't have to be directly job relevant um, to put on your resume. But I do ask that you make your resume relevant to the job you're applying to. Too often there is no cover letter or no context of how this resume um, shows that you're a qualified candidate for the job you just applied to. Yeah, that's, that's, that's like music to my ears. I had like a lot of these conversations and sort of two to three pages is the sweet spot for, for resumes. And <clears throat> generally, if you're if you're entry level, fresh out of college, one page is, is great. If you've got a lot of experience and you're squashing it down to one page, generally you're using a font that's too small and or you're not expanding enough. So like that two to three pages, I always think is a, a sweet spot. Um, and the things like photos, and I know, I know exactly what Chris is talking about here because Obviously, you don't put, want to put photos on your actual uh, resume itself. But on LinkedIn, that's a personal choice whether you have a picture there or not. The one thing I would say is if you choose to have a picture, make it a professional one. Because um, I've seen people up there with pictures of their cars. You know, just as, like I, I personally think if you're going to choose to do that, you know, you don't have to go and pay for a professional headshot. Just get somebody to, you know, take a picture of you with a, a blank background, you know, wearing whatever, whatever you think looks makes you look professional. And just, I would just encourage people to do that. Um, off the back of this, the whole diversity thing as a company, Tyra Security, we we try and affect it just by helping out in the system. We can't really, you know, get we can get more people into the interview process, um, but we can't guarantee people jobs. So that's not, you know, we're not not in that but, but what we've done i actually launched yesterday did a press release went out yesterday and it's something called the next CISO program we've already got um people on the program it's a six-month apprenticeship program it's completely free of charge to join um, we only have limited spaces we have already started the process so we will let you know when the next one's due but we've partnered up with the cloud security alliance um we've partnered up with a company called Exin that do ISO, ISO certification um, in knowledge and training. And you'd get CCSK. And then also as part of all this, you actually get to work on some of the projects that, that our professional services side are working on. So you come out with commercial experience of doing risk assessments um, and, and, and things like that. So we're trying to do our bit for it. I think everybody, everybody is that cares about it in our industry. Um, so for entry level people, look out for those kind of programs. We're not the only one that's doing them. There's a lot out there. And most that I see are, are, are free of charge to, to join. It's just a matter of getting picked out and out of that group. And each, each group will have different things they're looking for. So try and find that out. Much the same as when you're applying for a job, right? Write your resume, take the look at the job description and get your resume and make sure that the bullet points under what you've done uh, first of all, they're very honest. They are what you've done, but they're relevant to that particular job. Because if you if you can't take the time to write a resume for that specific job, then how interested are you really? I mean, that's the message you're kind of sending. Um, so anyway, and there's a there's a good question here from Gary. He asked um, about the change in 2018 um, California law, and and actually I think it was already already in place in Massachusetts. There's a few other states with it basically made it um, illegal for employers to ask salary, uh, the current salary um, or salary history. So Gary asked what kind of impact that's had. And it's been a really interesting one for us. 
Um, so I, I don't know with you guys whether you, you you get involved in in that part of it. But have you seen any changes? Um, for me, with this hit while I was at NCC, um, and it it never it didn't change the way um, the questions I was asking or the, how I approached it. But it may obviously made me be very careful with my words to make sure I could still ask the same question. You know, checking with the appropriate people before doing it in an interview. But that. I, I honestly don't care what you've been paid. Um, what I care is, what do you expect to be paid? What do you, what, what, it, what is, what do you need to actually have this? Be, if I want to, if I want you to join my team, I'm going to come up with some value based on the metrics I have of whether company guidance, current team sets, how I view your skills, and how you're going to provide there. But that's also kind of a fuzzy value. And if, if your needs are slightly above that, or um, then, then that's good for me to know. And I have that flexibility to meet that. Um, the, the thing that I always would come to candidates in is just like, if you have an approximate range that, that or like values that mean these are, it's a non-starter, that's good for me to know. So we don't spin cycles on this. But like, if I offer you a dollar and you are expecting a million, we're way off base. But like, if I'm coming at, at with like, you know, 120, 140, and you are, you need 150, like, that's great, but it helps gauge, like, if I come with the 120 first, and you counter with 150, we're a little further off, where if I, we just start at the 140 to get to the 150. So just sort of barometers to help gauge that is always what I'm trying to, to, to see. It doesn't matter. I don't care if you were a 60K, 40K minimum wage and you're looking for 150, if you need 150 and I value around around that, then we're good. Brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. Marissa? I think the positive impact, and I haven't studied enough data to know for sure, but I have seen some studies that the, the wage gap, uh, the discrepancy between men and women is supposed to be closing ever so slightly, although the pandemic may have changed some of those things and types in terms of the types of roles that are needing to be filled now. But I know that the goal of pulling the salary question was an effort to try and align those salaries from a gender perspective. So I've been following this for a couple of years before it hit in 2018. And I honestly, I, I don't feel like there has been a negative impact because like Andy said, it's just about having a transparent conversation. Uh, and anyone who's interviewed with me knows that the number I'm trying to get to is what is your floor? And ideally, if you could target another number, what would that be? So that I know what a minimum offer looks like for you or would have to be in order to make it worth everyone's time. But I also know what a great offer would be if we want to close you right away, get you on the job and make everyone excited. So it's, I think what the conversation should be about is you knowing what your bottom dollar is and what does the role mean to you? Because, you know, and I can't speak for an organization other than Tanium, we want to find the right person for the role. So if, if there's no way that we can make an offer work, then there's probably an organization within Tanium that where we can find you something that will, right? If, you, if you've got the right skill set. So that's good, Chrissy. Yeah, I really appreciate what Marissa said about the the kind of gender impact um, of of that law being passed. Um, I would I had just started my recruiting career when that law was passed, so um, it was a bit of an adjustment for me to not be able to just directly ask people anymore. Um, but I do always let my candidates know that they're more than welcome to self-disclose their salary. Um, it does, I think, help that that can also, you know, there are pros and cons to that, to, to self-disclosing, because you could um, price yourself out of a position or you could completely undersell yourself for a really significant raise if that company has resources beyond your current or previous employers. So um, I would say just, just proceed with caution, but I don't necessarily think that there's a reason to share your current salary unless you're interviewing for a position that is actually a bit a bit lower than what you're used to being paid. Yeah. 
Yeah, I know, um, uh, like Marissa was saying, uh, and what Chrissy was just talking, touching on, that probably the biggest concern here is people uh, saying like a lower number than the offer might have been originally, um, and and then you get paid less because the company can get away with it. They know. I I don't operate that way. I don't think anybody on this on this panel operates that way. There are obviously are going to be some some companies that, that that will operate that way. My my interest here is if if your minimum is above what I was targeting, but is reachable, then that's great for me to know. If your minimum is below what I'm targeting, then I'm just excited to give you an awesome offer. Like it's not that oh I can save my company money and, and stuff. It is you know it's really just making sure that. I, uh, I come come through with an offer that initially meets your minimum expectations because I've worked at NCC, I've now worked at Zoom. Those are my, uh, you know, the bounds I have to for context. I don't know what other companies are, are paying and I know what I value the market skill sets at, but you know, we also have to market adjust sometimes as different companies are paying uh, for similar skill sets that I'm competing against. Yeah, the whole, um this one's always been very interested to me because I think the only, like, as I think Chrissy, you said, if you're taking a drop down in salary because you're really excited about a certain position, that in that's the one instance, then I probably say to somebody, if you want to choose to disclose your salary, this is probably a good time to do it because you're letting them know this is how I'm excited and, and money isn't my most important factor. Now, if the company can pay you more, back what you were on before, excellent. Um, but other than that, it is really useful to have a, um, a, a range. Uh, what we get, we get asked quite a lot as an, an external agency, well, what range is this job? And, and most, and, and if we've got it, we, we, we will tell them. The, the one difficult, difficult, difficult when we talk about pros and cons, most of this has been pros, but the one con I have found is when you give somebody a salary range, their head goes to the top of that range Right. And all of a sudden their range was like 150 to 200 and you tell them and they say, oh, they, they, they go through the process. They love the company. But in their head, they've spent the three interviews thinking I'm going to earn 200 grand and they're not at the level to earn 200 grand. You know, they value them at you know, 180 or something. And that might have been more than they were originally looking for. When you give an offer like that, you'd expect them to be really excited. And instead, they have this level of disappointment because they could have paid me up to 200 grand. And so that's the real difficulty about getting a range. Um, people automatically will assume they're nearer to the top of that range. Um, I always think that the best thing for you to do is give a range that you are personally looking for. Give us a bottom line minimum. You know, I don't want to speak to any companies that, that are offering a, a, you know, less than this. And then go out there and, 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 you know, see what you can get. Because Andy, as you said, we are not seeing companies nickel and dime for these people. They're so excited to find the right person. They're not trying to under offer. They're, you know, they're making in pretty much every case, they're making exceptionally good offers. What I will say actually is that since the move to remote, we've had a couple of clients that have struggled because in their head, they figured remote would be less. They've struggled to put numbers on remote. I don't think there's very good compensation around um, compensation information around remote candidates. And so we've just had to encourage them. They've had to go back and come back with the same type of offer they would have offered if the person was, you know, was there on site. So that's been tough. But Marissa, did you have anything to see? You look like you're ready to say something there. <laughs> I do. And <laughs> up, Chris. Good job. Was, <laughs> we're talking a lot about like engineers, right? But, you know, being that I was very involved with ISS at ALA, I know that it's not just engineers in this group. You have people that are in sales, you have people that are managers, that are directors, that are CISOs and higher. So I think it's important to understand what kind of package you're looking for if you are a leadership um, or interviewing for a leadership position or a sales position, right? What is the total package you're looking for? with COVID and everything that's going on? Are there severance packages? What does it look like? Are you being brought on to do something temporary or is this a long-term strategic role for, for what it is you're looking to do for your career? So all of those things need to take 
need to be taken into account. And each of those things may have a different value for you and your personal life. But ask about bonus, ask about equity, really understand what that equity is, right? Is that stock? Is that shares? Is it a direct buy? How long is the vesting period? Is there an accelerated vesting schedule, right? All of those things need to be understood. Um, and what does that mean to your financial portfolio? And if things go left and COVID causes a company to go bankrupt, what does that mean for you? So sometimes it's not about just the initial offer, but how secure is the company? And maybe the company with the lower offer is the better decision because this company with a super high valuation that's been around for 10 days might not last that long. <laughs> yeah, so it's funny. Um, my talk yesterday, I, I compared the salary and benefits to a cupcake. I was like, the base salary is your actual cake, right? You gotta have decent cake to, to, to start with, right? But then all the benefits, that flavor, the icing on the top, really, you know, that really makes such a big difference. And so we see, I think we see more and more people where the base is, uh, there's a lot more flexibility in base nowadays because there are so many other ways to, to offer benefits around it that can impact that. Um, so I've definitely, definitely seen that happen. Now, this is funny because we're sitting here talking at an ISSA meeting and a few people have asked about how things have changed in terms of, well, somebody asked how can they get involved more with the security community? And I think that's probably a good place to start, especially as we're here. Marissa, you were a, a board member of ISSA, so I'm sure you've got some um, great ideas. So Marissa, over to you. If you are great with social media, please volunteer. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I was formerly the marketing director. Social media is not my area of strength. And I'm sure all the board members are laughing right now. But <laughs> um, certainly if you are strong in social media or you're willing to learn it to do it, please volunteer. It's even with Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu, we luckily we've got a volunteer on our leadership team that is doing it. But because of the nature of our industry and security, right, where we tend to be a more protective of our data and what we put on social media, it's not really an easy position to fill. <laughs> so I'd say if you are willing to, if you've got a sales background, if you've got a good following, please volunteer. Um, but, and I saw Lori Barfield enter a question in the chat. So volunteer to be a resume reviewer. Lori runs Raise Me around really the country. She does so much good work, uh, whether it's resume development, if you want to give a talk and share your experience. Um, I personally hired two people, one from an ISSALA event and one from a Cloud Security Alliance event. So and, and it wasn't immediately, right? It wasn't the first time I met them and we made a hire, but over the course of seeing them, you know, at different events throughout the year or years, um, they evolved into the, the person we needed to fill a position. So know that the long-term investment is what you're really going for here in the community, not just looking to get an immediate return by volunteering, but what can you offer? What can you contribute? So that when your time does come, right, you are a known person to the community and people will vouch for you and say, you're a great person. You know, why wouldn't, why wouldn't this company want to work for you? But I mean, anything you can do to get involved, volunteer with ISSALA, with Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu, with ShellCon, with Raise Me, with Layer One that's out there, um, with all the DEF CON groups, whether it's 562 or through and O, I mean, you've got SparkleCon, there's so many different things just in SoCal. And I know the Bay Area has got a ton, uh, if not the same or more, but there's just too many opportunities to pass up that look really great on your resume and are a well use or a well use of the space um, that I consider resume real estate. <laughs> Yeah, Andy, do you, as the sort of, as, the, as our, our resident technical person on this panel, um, you know, these are technical people asking these questions. How do you see it from your side? Yeah, so um, it's, it's one of those interesting spaces. You see a lot of people who are very proactive in the community, like engaged on social uh, media, speaking at conferences, volunteering and stuff. And then you have others that are members of the community, but they're not super proactive. I fall into that, that latter category that 
I go to the conferences, I track um, people on Twitter, I sit in Slack channels, I haven't really gotten into discords and stuff, but those are all good spaces to hang out and then watch for opportunities where you can ask a question where you're interested and of some of somebody like, you know, also recognizing that the most boisterous people in the industry aren't always the right people to network with. They're, um, but that you find somebody that their interest or their area of expertise aligns with one of your interests and ask them a, a question, like an appropriate question or, uh, you know, about something they just talked about or something you read about on their blog post or they gave a talk about, or, you know, you see them asking similar questions to what you had and, you know, you start to make these little connections because for me, on Twitter, asking a question of somebody with hundreds of thousands or um, of followers or tens of thousands of followers is intimidating for me, who I've been in in this space for 20 years professionally for over uh, over 12 years now, spoken at conferences. It's intimidating for me to reach out to these people. And so I, I do it more privately and stuff, and it, and it goes really well for me. And so you don't have to be the volunteer or that super outgoing, proactive personality. You just start to build little connections, more intimate connections um, with individuals. Yeah, that's a great point. I I love that thought process because we're all very different personalities in, in, in the world, right? Not just in our industry. Everybody's got their own way of doing things. Um, and I can just tell you from like, from my talk yesterday and, and from the others I've done this this year the like just a message that some i've had these linkedin connection requests from people i have no connections with in common with and they just send you a message and like i really enjoyed your talk thank you so much or like like that was kind of just in like it, you're making somebody's day so don't like if you're thinking about not doing that what you'll actually find is you're probably making the person's day because they might have a huge amount of followers but like having somebody that's actually really engaged in whatever you've done and is genuinely interests interested really motivates you to do more of it. So yeah, I think it's a, that's a great point. I need to be very visible, but for those that don't wish to be, it's an amazing way. You might find yourself a mentor. You might find yourself a new job. Um, you don't have to be this big, well-known branded person to, to get those opportunities. Chrissy? Yeah, I have to agree. I think I read a statistic somewhere that it's something like 90% of jobs come from someone you know. And maybe that person you know is someone from the security community. Maybe it's a recruiter who you've taken the time to respond to and you know build rapport with. Um, a few other ideas that I have, and I'm really curious to hear what Andy has to say about this as a technical hiring manager. Um, but I've seen some kind of, you know, earlier career security people um, participating in more bug bounties or contributing to the open source community, um, teaching or mentoring at cybersecurity boot camps. Um, I guess that's if you have a little bit more experience. Um, but then also to Marissa's point, um, you know, volunteering, and sometimes it's as easy as, uh, you know, getting on Meetup and seeing what security events, Meetup, Eventbrite, et cetera, what security events are in your community. And now that we're all remote, they don't even necessarily have to be in your community. They could be in the cities where you want to find jobs or whatever, and then get on LinkedIn and, you know, link up with the people who are running those groups and make yourself known in, in that way and ask if you can volunteer in some way. Um, but Andy, I'm curious what you think about, about bug bounties and open source contributions. Yeah, um, those definitely um, are a great way to show interest in the space. Um, the, it always leads to um, making sure it ex expressing your interest in the right way. Like, A, are you, are you, actively and healthily engaged in the in those activities um you know if uh, there from my experience from having done consulting for 12 years i know a lot of security programs and the, the their personnel there and so if you talk about your participation in there there i might have um a, a back channel informal reference to to reach out to and be like when this person engaged with your company was it a productive conversation or not and so make sure 
just because you're participating, that you're participating in a positive way. It's not just being involved um, and then getting frustrated, um, uh, you know, when, when it doesn't go your way, you know, sort of like a rejection in a job interview, you know, you're going to have rejections on bug bounties that you disagree with, or that, you know, your open source contribution didn't get merged in or somebody um, took it apart. Like we're a critical industry. Um, and so you're gonna have people be critical of your work and it's just making sure that like, you are positive in your interactions with, with the community because it's, it is a small space. A lot of people talk. And so, you know, make sure you're, you're building those uh, healthy relationships. Yeah. I, I, it's funny the, that in the interaction, I always think you, you, you want to treat somebody how you'd want to be treated every single interaction you have. And I remember when I was earlier on in my career, I was involved in recruiting one of the first, things I would do at the end of an interview was go and speak to the person on reception and find out what their interaction was with them when, when they came in. And, and, and I, I had like with, with 86 candidates that, had, uh, you know, that, that basically were, were, were rude and then they put on their interview face and they were, you know, people do that. Remember your, and it might be a bit different now in, in the scenarios and the situation that we're in a pandemic, you know, that, but for every single interaction you have can be so important for for your career so make sure they're genuine be nice be kind right doesn't 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 cost a lot to do that yeah i would echo that um i definitely talk to the non-explicit parts of the interview process to understand how was their experience with the candidate to understand their sort of how did they handle the initial uh, recruiters contact how did they handle you know whoever was scheduling the the meetings you know I d it's never intentional but how did they handle if i had to do a rescheduling and stuff was, was that very casual or was did that instantly sort of ruffle their feathers and stuff and you know are they sort of quick to put on a, a professional face but um in the background they have um some stronger social viewpoints that uh, could ruffle feathers yeah, actually, that, that reminds me about, you know, this, the same goes if you're if you're on Twitter or you, you're on your social media, just bear in mind. And I know we're, you know, we're talking about security people. You'd be surprised how many of them don't have it locked down to private. And just remember the stuff that you're putting out there publicly, um, that's available for everybody to read. And you'll probably find that, you know, a lot of the people involved in this interview process, their OSINT skills are pretty decent. So tracking down what your, you know, what your open Facebook or Twitter is posting. And so anything that you're willing to post and put out there in public, just, just know you're going to have to stand by that. And um, I have seen people uh, not get interviews um, for some of the things that they've posted. So just bear that in mind. Your social interactions are very important. What you put out there publicly is out there. Um, that actually, Laurie asked a question and we're coming towards the end. So I don't think we've got time for too many more, but Laurie actually said, like with these events and the things we're talking about, um, have, how, are we, how are we finding candidates and how have these events being virtual rather than in, in person affected, you know, what we, what we go about doing? Yeah, um, compared to, to pre-pandemic, I've been more proactive in, in posting the link um, of trying to get the, the job postings and the opportunities out there in front of people and Slack channels um, on LinkedIn, uh, tweeting about them and stuff like that, as well as if I see a candidate um, or somebody talking about uh, somebody that like, almost like an indirect referral if somebody I respect in the industry is talking up somebody else and they they align with an opportunity that I'm aware of um, at my company then I'll, I'll sort of like nudge a recruiter and be like hey you know like I don't know if this person's looking but it, you know it's a, it's the type of candidate I'd be interested in or if I see I've this morning I woke up to somebody on Twitter that I, I follow so I respect um, some of their contributions to the industry say I'm looking for new opportunities. And so I reached out to them proactively. And so I monitor for those types of things a bit more than relying on inbound or eventually meeting the right candidates in person. Marissa, Chrissy? Absolutely. We're, I mean, as a recruiter, we're always on social media looking for 
for candidates, right? Um, I think LinkedIn is the place where you're going right for your professional kind of profile, but don't discount a meetup, right? Like I've been putting together a lot of events for Tanium, right? Whether it's uh, an event for our SkillBridge candidates that are like local to a base or being hosted virtually at a base, or we're doing an event for other nonprofits in the community like Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu, right? We're, we're hosting a CTF for a specific group because we want to see what your hands-on skills are, right? We want to see who gets on that leaderboard because we wanna hire you. So don't take those events for granted. Know that as a recruiter, I'm always looking and yes, we wanna be a resource to the community, but it's even greater if we can get a hire so that we can start giving more partnership, more time and more money to those organizations that are yielding great hires for us. So, you know, it's, it's good for the community. It's good for the company. Uh, and I think it's great for the relationship because you get to know, right, the person that is giving this webinar, um, but always sourcing, um, creating more events internally, uh, even though we can't do them in person, uh, those virtual events are definitely an area as well as meetup is where we're finding more people. Brilliant. Chrissy? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that, Marissa. And um, to echo what you said about LinkedIn and always being on social media, we get a lot of candidates from LinkedIn and build a lot of relationships from LinkedIn. Um, before I was a recruiter, I was a much more bashful candidate than I probably ever would be in the future now, um, should I ever need another job, which I hope I don't. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I, think, I think the candidates who, um, who really stand out to me are the ones who reach out and they aren't afraid to be direct because it's such a massive pool, I can't possibly find absolutely everyone as hard as I might try. Um, I love it when people reach out to me and send me a message on LinkedIn or um, you know, find my email address on my LinkedIn profile and drop me their resume or just give us a call. I think it's a, it's, don't hesitate to be direct, especially if your skills match the, the job description. But to that same effect, um, a lot of skilled people self-reject and so I encourage, I encourage you, if you have cybersecurity skills and experience, to go for it and don't self-reject. It's a, I guess, imposter syndrome and all of that. It's such a common um, phenomenon, but um, we get a lot of candidates who have zero cybersecurity experience, and those are not the ones that I'm calling, so... <laughs> Yeah, um, that speaks to one of the questions we have here um, about, uh, you know, what if the requirements ask for the moon um, entry level, but requires a CISP and compliance experience and stuff like that. Um, I, my, building off of sort of that don't discount yourself, you know, we suffer from imposter syndrome. I, you know, I struggle with it all the time that if it seems completely off base, you know, like, 20 years of Swift development experience. Swift has been around for what, nine years or something like an impossible ask. Do a bit more research on, on the company and the job and see like, is that really a place you wanna work for? They see, can, seem kind of off basis. If otherwise the requirements just seem a bit much for what they're asking, they're trying to, trying to like cater to probably a specific type of candidate pool, but that shouldn't discount you from feeling like you can reach out being proactive, like Chrissy was saying, to the recruiter, to the hiring um, team to say, hey, this is me. This is how I feel I, I, I meet or would excel at this job, but I feel like there's these gaps and I wanna know how critical these are for being successful in the role. Um, because it could be like, they say sis because, you know, hey, somebody told recruiting to put a certification on the job rec, you know? Those of us making the hiring decision or involved in the hiring process aren't always the people doing the final edits or or even the bulk of the writing of the job recs. And so you probably still have an opportunity even if you don't meet all the requirements. It's just, do you feel like you could contribute to the company in the role as described, not necessarily the requirements to fulfill that role? 
Yeah, absolutely. That's um, I was going to lead on to that. I was perfectly onto that question. Um, and it, it comes up an awful lot. Uh, yeah, believe in yourself. And if you're not feeling like you're getting anywhere replying to those adverts, then if you need to connect directly on LinkedIn to the people that you think are hiring or the individuals that are in charge of the process, um, then connect directly with them and let them ask those questions. Um, now that I think we're completely done. So what I would just say is thank you all so much for taking part in this. There's a load more questions. Anybody's got extra questions? I think I think we're all recruiting on this on on this call. So maybe connect with us on LinkedIn and uh, reach out and feel free to ask your questions. And you know we may well be looking for people like yourself anyway. So you might find yourself being tapped up to see if you're looking for a position. Um, but thank you so, so much. Lots of questions still left. So do feel free to connect out and let us know. I want to give a big round of applause to all of our panelists. That was wonderful. Um, I think everyone in the community could benefit from some of this good advice. Uh, please, if you're watching, share with your uh, peers who haven't had a chance to watch this. This is on YouTube. It's there for your uh, viewing pleasure, along with tons of ISSA Los Angeles videos that we've taken both from these virtual meetings and at past security summits. Um, so with that, I want to thank you all again. Stay safe and do join us for the uh, next ISSA Los Angeles meeting in December, which we'll be talking about the new privacy regulations. And then don't forget our goodbye damn 2020 celebration at the end of the month.